Wow. Welcome, everybody, to the seventh in our new online climate, climate series, Climate Spotlight, where we're featuring some of the most uh, innovative thinkers, businesses, conservationists in Maine, with an aim to help the Maine people understand how climate change impacts our state. Today is a special one. It's our last Climate Spotlight series presentation of the year. Uh, you can tell I'm in celebration mode because I'm, I'm wearing a tie. Uh, this is the first tie I've worn in 2020. I had to watch a YouTube tutorial to remember how I even uh, tie these things. Um, since July 14th, we've completed six Climate Spotlight presentations focusing on the state of Maine's climate, community solar, rooftop solar, forests as natural climate solutions, transportation, and home energy efficiency. You can watch them all at maineaudubon.org slash energy. And I'm going to go ahead and toss that in the chat. Paste. Um, my name is Nick Lund. I'm the network and outreach manager for Maine Audubon. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you're not a member of Maine Audubon, you should be. We're a great organization. Come on over to maineaudubon.org and, and join us. Um, today is our presentation uh, called The Latest from the Maine Climate Council. And we've got some updates on the most important environmental work being done in the state right now. The Maine Climate Council, a bipartisan group of Mainers from all walks of life coming together to find solutions to our climate crisis. Uh, today, we're joined by two folks in the middle of that work, Dr. Cassandra Rose from the Maine Climate Council from the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, and Dr. Amanda Cross from the Department of Inland Maine, excuse me, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, unfortunately, my colleague Eliza Donahue, who was scheduled to join us today, cannot join us. Um, she's sick, she's feeling better, not COVID, uh, but uh, uh, she's doing well, but just couldn't join today. I will uh, say a few things uh, in her stead. Um, uh, I'll do some more introductions in a moment, but um, just a few um, housekeeping items. Um, first, of course, the reason that we are host hosting these presentations is to raise awareness of the Maine Climate Council. Um, which is deliberating now on a climate action plan set for release in early December. Um, the Climate Council is meeting later in this month, uh, October 21st, to continue the discussion of the contents of their action plan, and the public is invited to listen in. Um, Maine Audubon strongly encourages you to click on this link, which I will post right now. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure... Um, Cassie and Amanda will probably be talking about this a little bit more, but um, click on that link to register and to attend that meeting, which is scheduled for Wednesday, October 21st at 9 a.m. All right, Dr. Cassandra Rose is the Senior Science Analyst and Climate Council Coordinator at the Governor's Office of Policy, Innovation, and the Future, uh, which has the delightful acronym of GOPIF. Um, she holds a master's of science degree in geology from the University of California, Riverside, and a doctor of philosophy degree in earth and environmental science from Columbia University, and came to Maine and GOPIF after working at the American Geosciences Institute. Welcome, Cassandra, and welcome to the cat. What was the name of the cat again? I forgot. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Max. Max, um, okay. And, uh, those of you who joined our second meeting in September may recognize him. He has a penchant for um, joining me in my awesome. public presentations. Um, thank you, everybody. Oh, I'm going to keep going on some introductions, actually, before we get started. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. Um, and I, I was alerted from the chat that the links uh, that I was sending are not coming through. I apologize. I was sending them to the wrong people. So that should come through. That is the link to register for the... Um, Climate Council meeting on October 21st, and here is the link to watch the rest of the um, Climate Spotlight presentations that we've been doing since July. Thank you for letting me know about that, folks, and hopefully those came through. Um, I'll uh, continue with introductions first and um, do a quick technical thing, and then we'll, we'll get started um, with Cassandra. So Dr. Amanda Cross works at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, She's got several titles. Her email signature uh, is like paragraphs long, including wildlife resource supervisor, beginning with habitat coordinator, and Maine's 2015 to 2025 wildlife action plan coordinator. 
Um, I may have left some things out. Uh, of course, uh, also among her important duties is serving uh, on the Science and Technical Subcommittee and the Coastal and Marine Working Group for the Maine Climate Council. Um, she's coming to us from Hartswell. Uh, welcome, Amanda. Okay, Great, so just a few. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. Just a few, um, and um, we'll turn it over to Cassandra, is the correct pronunciation. I've been screwing it up the whole time. I apologize. A um, few technical notes before you get started. Uh, Cassandra will go first, followed by Amanda. Uh, we will uh, wrap things up by about 11.45-ish or so, uh, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, which means, uh, if you haven't seen it already, that the, um, all the attendees are uh, muted and their videos are off. Uh, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box you see down in the middle center of the screen. Um, that, uh, if you put them in the chat, we'll lose them with other chats and it's much easier to organize in the Q&A. So if you could please do that. You can enter those questions at any time. Uh, we'll save them for the end and answer them together. Um, that's all, I think we're ready to go. So um, Cassandra Rose, if you could get started, take it away. Thanks, Nick, and thank you very much for inviting us to speak with you today. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you. Um, as Nick mentioned, I'm the Maine Climate Council Coordinator in the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. If you are on our newsletter, you've gotten a lot of emails from me. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And you, many of you may already be fairly familiar with the Maine Climate Council. I believe Nick said that you have had some presentations on it in the past, but I'll give you a little bit of introduction to orient you and we'll be talking today about where we're at in the climate action uh, planning process and some recent reports that have come out to help inform the Maine Climate Council as it deliberates on the strategies to go into the climate action plan. We're here today to talk about climate change, but I want to first acknowledge that the COVID-19 crisis um, that we're facing in our communities and a nation has absolutely been a, a huge impact on um, all of our communities this year. The pandemic is front of mind for all of us, and it can be tempting to push climate to the back burner. COVID-19 is not a result of climate change, but it is a tragic example of the kinds of multiple overlapping crises that communities and states will face in a climate altered world. These crises can't be ignored and neither will be solved without collective action. Unfortunately, this year we've seen a lot of these multiple overlapping crises with a lot of natural disasters like wildfires and hurricanes and tropical storms impacting different parts of our nation at the same time as we're facing the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're already starting to see how these multiple overlapping crises can make it really hard to adjust to and plan for either. Furthermore, like COVID-19, climate change has outsized negative impacts on people with the least means to protect themselves, especially poor and marginalized communities. The Climate Council is tasked with ensuring that our most vulnerable communities are prioritized and that the benefits of new policies and programs are equitably distributed. When Governor Mills came to office, she made tackling climate change a priority for her administration. And she tasked my office, the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, otherwise known as GOPIF, with leading the state's efforts to address climate change. But we can't do this alone. We're really fortunate to have very dedicated partners like the Department of Inland, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and Maine Audubon and key offices around state government and the private sector throughout the entire climate action plan process throughout the last year. The Climate Council was established in 2019 through bipartisan legislation, and it was tasked with producing a statewide climate action plan every four years that both addresses the need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the need to become more resilient to the impacts of climate change. The same legislation established two ambitious greenhouse gas reductions targets a 45% reduction by 2030, and at least 80% by 2050. And the legislation also included instructions to ensure that the state also builds out resilience to the impacts of climate change. 
Governor Mills laid out an additional goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2045 in line with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recommendation of ensuring global carbon neutrality by 2050 to keep global temperatures from rising above two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The Climate Change Council is charged with developing the plan to meet these targets and goals, which is due to the um, legislature and governor this December 1st. I apologize, I'm going to pause one moment just to plug in the battery of my laptop, which I should have done before this, so I do apologize and thank you for bearing with the minor interruption. Thank you. The Maine Climate Council is currently considering and selecting among many excellent strategies recommended by its six working groups and the scientific and technical subcommittee. They're considering these strategies in the context of public feedback and re several recent reports and analyses, which I'll be talking about in the next few slides. But over the coming months, they'll be finalizing which strategies recommended by the working groups um, or strat additional strategies recommended by climate council members will be included in this first four-year climate action plan, which as I mentioned before, will be delivered to the legislature and governor on December 1st. The next Maine Climate Council meeting will be held Wednesday, October 21st, and it's open to public observation. Please feel free to visit climatecouncil.maine.gov for the registration link and details. And this is also the same link that Nick put in the chat before. So this is a maybe a familiar chart to some of you, but just in case nobody's seen it before, I thought I'd go over it briefly. The Maine Climate Council is a 39 member assembly of scientists, industry leaders, bipartisan state and local officials, um, representatives of Maine's youth and tribes and many more who are responsible for developing a climate action plan for Maine. These folks are um, have been appointed by the governor and they've been assisted by the work of six fantastic working groups and the scientific and technical subcommittee over the last year. Um, Dr. Amanda Cross, who is speaking right after me, is a member of the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee, as well as, um, I think at last count, at least two working groups. So she's had a really interesting and unique perspective working across a lot of these groups. So these working groups um, and the Climate Council all together comprise about 230 volunteer members who did a great deal of research, um, public stakeholder engagement and public and stakeholder engagement and development of uh, draft strategies to reduce our emissions and to adapt to the effects of climate change, which they presented to the, to the Climate Council in June. In addition, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee worked over the last year to produce a report that identifies the impacts of climate change in Maine, as well as a few other deliverables that I'll talk about um, on the next slide. So as I mentioned, the STS was charged with providing a summary of the impacts of climate change in Maine, as well as some specific projections like estimates of sea level rise over the next century. This group was comprised of over 30 volunteer scientists from government and non-government organizations around the state, plus bipartisan state legislator involvement. Their report covers subjects including broad climate change impacts, hydrology, biodiversity on land and at sea, public health, the economy, agriculture, and more. Um, many of these scientists came from the University of Maine, um, as well as other um, non-university, non-state organizations like Bigelow Labs, um, Gulf Maine Research Institute and many more. And we had helpful input from over 50 additional individuals that really helped to improve the report. So this diverse group of scientists volunteered a great deal of time and effort and expertise over the last year to provide the state of the science of the impacts of climate change in Maine, which is helping to inform the Climate Council as it considers strategies to tackle climate change in our state. I think this is a really interesting example of collaboration between a state policymaking process and scientists from around the state that's pretty unique in state level climate planning efforts around the United States. And throughout the entire process of the last year, the STS and working groups have had frequent and continual dialogue about what scientific information is helpful and needed for the development of good state policy, as well as what data gaps remain 
um, that need to be filled in order for better policy and decision making in the future. This is also set up to be an ongoing collaboration, not a one-time effort that I'll talk more um, about in a few slides. The legislature recognized when it created the Climate Council that the state of climate change will naturally shift and sometimes in unexpected ways. And the Climate Council and the STS will help keep the state apprised of the latest science and solutions to help better adjust our state level policymaking and adaptation efforts in the future. The STS report is a, an essential component of the state climate action plan, um, and it'll be a part of that final plan. As I mentioned, the sea level rise projections are a specific deliverable that'll help the state plan for the impacts of sea level rise now and in the future, and these must also be updated every four years. And this plan included not only a chapter reviewing how climate change will impact biodiversity, but also identified some science-based methods for building resilience for our state species. Amanda will be talking more about those conclusions right after me as one of the co-authors of that chapter. So I mentioned that there are several reports informing the Climate, Act, uh, the climate Council right now. Um, and the, one of the other big reports recently uh, finished was produced by Eastern, Re Eastern Research Group and Synapse Energy Economics um, to help inform the climate action planning process by providing economic analysis and greenhouse gas modeling of the draft strategies from the working groups. In addition, they produce vulnerability maps to some of the major impacts of climate change, as well as a cost of doing nothing or a cost to the state from climate change with our current status quo policies. Some of the largest findings from this cost of doing nothing analysis including the included the finding that if sea level rises up to 8.8 .8 feet by 2100, Maine could lose 97% of its dry beach area. Almost all of its sand dunes could be inundated and the Maine beaches region alone in Southern Maine may lose up to $1.67 billion in tourism spending annually due to the loss of that dry beach area. In addition, the loss of dune ecosystem services could lead to an additional $71.8 million or more in losses annually, plus the loss of essential habitat for endangered shorebird species like piping plover and least terns. There's a lot of great detail and information in the reports that I can't even begin to cover today. So I really encourage you to download the chapters at climatecouncil.maine.gov for more information. My office also worked with the University of Maine's Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions to assess the recommendations of the six working groups from an equity perspective. For each working group strategy, the S assessments sought to understand how it would affect vulnerable populations and to suggest improvements to the strategies that would help improve the equitable distribution of the benefits. They just delivered their final report to the Climate Council a couple of weeks ago, which is also available on our website. The recommendations in their report will be used to strengthen the climate strategies currently being considered by the Climate Council to improve them and to ensure that the benefits and costs of those strategies are distributed as equitably as possible across marginalized and vulnerable people all around Maine. Some of the overarching recommendations from this report including, uh, include ensuring that our engagement with climate equity issues continues throughout the incli entire climate action planning process and beyond into the implementation of the plan, as well as trying to continue to improve and support our participation in inclu and inclusion from a variety of stakeholders, especially from those communities who will be most impacted by climate change. In addition, the governor's energy office and my office are required to develop a plan to identify pathways and strategies for the advancement of Maine's clean energy economy. While Maine's 10-year economic plan, which was concluded last year, highlighted the opportunity to grow our clean energy economy with positive impacts reaching across many sectors, the strategies in this clean energy economy transition plan in combination with the climate action plan will help provide some specific strategies to leverage our renewable energy resources and energy efficiency services to recover and grow our economy, particularly with the recovery from COVID-19. The final report is still in the process of being developed and will be released later in October, but an executive summary is currently available on our website. So we also performed a great deal of public and stakeholder engagement um, 
since the delivery of the draft strategies in June, including um, doing a series of public feedback surveys. Um, and I know that a number of Maine Audubon members filled out those surveys, which we, we really thank you for sharing. Um, and we received over 4,400 responses from around Maine and over three quarters of Maine zip codes to these public feedback surveys. Now, um, in addition to that, we received a great number of letters, memos, and comments from different organizations and people from around the state. So the public feedback surveys was not a, uh, meant to be a scientifically robust public survey, but we did receive a great deal of really interesting and helpful feedback from the survey respondents. And I thought it was particularly um, uh, interesting to see that when people were asked about what aspects of their communities they're most concerned will be impacted by climate change, the top three things that they indicated were that they indicated were people's health, wetlands, coastlines, and intertidal zones, and wildlife. In addition, preserving the environment was by far the most important co-benefit of climate change strategies that survey respondents selected. So I think the survey respondents clearly showed that preserving the health of Maine's people, species, and environments is going to be a really important plan, part of any plan to tackle climate change. So right now my office has been taking all of the draft strategies and putting them into a larger framework that pulls similar strategies together for the Maine Climate Council to consider. And they're currently in the process of considering these six overarching strategies that we identified through this process. Um, so you can look at the draft framework on our website. Um, I'm going to just very quickly go through this here, but um, I would highly recommend taking a look at the framework on the website, um, which really builds on these very detailed reports that the working groups put together to support their strategy recommendations. So these strategies include themes like using less energy through efficiency, electrification of both our heating and transportation, and ensuring that our energy sources feeding the grid are also clean energy sources so that the energy that we do use is coming from non um, carbon sources as much as possible. The three adaptation working groups um, recommended a number of great strategies that we pulled together um, into these three uh, overarching buckets. And some common themes here were that science and monitoring are really important to track the impacts of climate change and be able to adapt to them. Technical assistance to our communities to both strengthen our natural, um, natural and working lands and waters is also really important. Nature-based solutions can be a very cost-effective way of addressing the impacts of climate change and also improve, improving the amount of carbon that we're sequestering in environments and updating state laws and programs as well. So that was a lot of information. I think I may have gone a little bit over, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Amanda now to talk a little bit more about her experiences and some of the conclusions that the SDS and the working groups came to throughout this process. Great, thank you very much, Cassie. Um, that was a really, really excellent overview of what has been a tremendous and, and many parted uh, process over the last year. Um, there's so many folks doing um, a lot of excellent work as part of this team and at, at uh, under um, the leadership of Cassie and others there at GoPIF, it's been a really interesting process to observe and participate in as a scientist, as a representative of a public agency um, and as a main citizen, it's, it's just been fascinating. So I'm going to share with you my screen. I'm gonna be talking about sort of one component of the Maine Climate Council process, really looking at biodiversity and the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. We're talking a little bit about um, some of the conclusions we came to as part of the science and technical subcommittee, some of the recommendations we've made, and then kind of what can we do now? Um, it is fantastic to have the statewide effort resulting in an action plan here in December that gives us sort of that statewide backing to take some steps that need to be, need to be taken to help conserve biodiversity. Diversity. Um, but there are things that we can do right now, even before that those results are finalized. So bear with me for a second while I share my screen and hopefully get the correct one in front of you.
Amanda is working on a fancy two monitor setup. <laughs> I am trying. I am trying here. <laughs> um, all right. You know what? It's funny. It worked perfectly when we practiced, didn't it? Yep. Okay. Um, Nick, can you see just my slide screen there in front of you? Yeah, looking good. All right, sorry guys, it took it. me a couple seconds there. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk today really sort of about one component of the Maine Climate Council, um, and and I think this is one that will resonate with this audience. Obviously, conserving biodiversity, whether it be fish, deer, plants, butterflies, what have you, is obviously a very important topic to the Maine um, Audubon community, and so. It's a huge topic, <laughs> of course. And so much of what I present today is going to be drawn from that biodiversity chapter that Cassie referenced before of the recently published scientific assessment of climate change and its effects in Maine. And while I co-authored this chapter with Sally Stockwell of Maine Audubon, we obviously could not do this assessment on our own. And so I've presented here kind of a, a list, a smattering of some of the resource experts that helped craft this chapter with us. There are many, many people out there with expertise in all, all sorts of different topics when it comes to biodiversity. So it was really truly a group effort to try to do an assessment of biodiversity in Maine and the impacts of climate change. So before I delve into Maine though, I wanna set the stage a little bit in terms of global climate change and sort of how Maine will likely mirror a lot of the trends that we're already seeing at a global scale. So many of you, particularly those of you who are in the birding community, likely saw this report that came out last year in Science, Rosenberg et al., um, documenting this huge decline in birds since the 1970s. So three billion birds is the sort of the, the shorthand version of that report that you see in the news media. And this study reported that one in four birds have been lost since the 1970s. In addition, we're seeing trends in other taxonomic groups, such as a 75% decline in insects in Germany, even in protected areas. So in areas where there's no development, no management, in those areas, we're still seeing large scale declines of insects. And I promise I won't leave you completely depressed, but we do have to be realistic to set the stage here. Um, and, and other studies have looked at sort of what's going to happen in the future. So we have observed declines in species now, what are we likely to see? And basically we're looking at something that, that is unprecedented perhaps if we don't take action now. So looking at a decline of 34 to 58% of species globally faced with extinction if species cannot move and shift on the landscape in response to changing climate conditions. Even if these species can shift and move on the landscape, and when I say species, I'm using that broadly to mean plants as well as wildlife, fish and wildlife. Even if those species can shift, it may not be enough. And we may be looking at a loss of somewhere between 11 to 33% loss of species. What does that look like in Maine? What do we stand to lose here in Maine? So this graph you see here on the left is a breakdown of what we have, or at least what we know of here in Maine. Um, we have over 33,000 species, fish and wildlife species here in Maine. Most of those represented in blue here on the graph are invertebrates. And you can see taxonomically how it breaks down, 423 bird species, 85 mammals, et cetera. We also have about 2,100 plants, a variety of phytoplankton, fungi, et cetera. So that's the stage. That's what we're dealing with right now in terms of what we stand to lose. And relatively, we have quite a bit of diversity here in Maine when you compare us with other New England states. And why is that? It's because we're at an ecological transition zone. We're at the northern edge of northern hardwood forests and the, the southern edge of more alpine or sorry, more boreal type systems. And so we're, we're at this, this um, edge of these two different systems. And so we're going to see representative species from each of those kind of mixed together here on our landscape. And that holds true both for our terrestrial systems, as well as our aquatic systems and our ocean systems too. And just to kind of put that again into a global context, what we have here in Maine is really, really interesting. Over the, the two degrees of latitude change that we have here in Maine, we see, um, sorry, the 20 degree latitude change here that we have in Maine. There's a similar change in Europe 
that exists. We have, sorry, let me back up. We have a three degree latitude change here in Maine. Compare that with Europe. We see the same change over a 20 degree latitude. So what we have over a three degree shift here in Maine in terms of climates is spread out over a 20 degree latitude change in Europe. So that's the distance of like two Californias. So all of that huge, huge latitude change, all the distributions of species that would occur throughout that 20 degree change in Europe is all squished and compressed down to a three degree change here in Maine. So we have quite a, quite a bit diversity here. So of those 33,000 plus species, fish and wildlife species, plus plants and everything else that we have here in Maine, what is it that makes a species vulnerable to climate change versus not. And so generally studies have shown that there are about six characteristics that can make a species vulnerable to climate change, to not doing well in a changing climate. I have them listed here. So things like habitat specificity. So species that can only occur in one kind of narrow area. The Katahdin Arctic butterfly is an example of that. It's only occurring at the highest, highest elevations on Mount Katahdin, nowhere else. Um, edge of range is another characteristic. So species where I said, again, we're right at the northern, northern edge for some species and the southern edge of others. Those species that are at the edges of their range with shifting and climate conditions can get bumped out of Maine, either north or south. And things like that may you know, include moose and mink frogs. Um, species that have kind of a narrow uh, ability to, to be able to tolerate different temperatures. So brook trout are a great example of that. They really need those cold, cool water streams to persist. They can't really deal with large temperature fluctuations. Also um, species that, that are in systems that are really kind of, the phenology is really specific. So when things happen in that system are tied closely to what that species is doing. So vernal pool organisms, for example, really need a, a certain timing of spring rains to be able to, to lay their eggs and develop and get out of pools before they dry. Um, changes to those systems can make those species that breed in vernal pools vulnerable. Species that have limited mobility, plants. Plants are a huge um, group of, of organisms that have limited mobility in, in, you know, compared with something like a moose or a bear. Um, and also species that are sensitive to pathogens. We'll talk a little bit about moose as an example of that in a minute. And so, to better understand the state of Maine species in light of climate change, um, we had a very timely process in sort of leading up to this Maine Climate Council process. Every 10 years, we do an assessment of all the species in Maine through a process called the Wildlife Action Plan. Every state does it. And we did our last one in 2015. And at the time we had just completed, the state had just completed a statewide vulnerability assessment of all the plant and animals and habitats in Maine. And we took that information combined with other risk factors to determine which species in Maine were at risk. This particular plan deals with fish and wildlife species. So I'm gonna to speak to those right now. So looking at all the different factors that are affecting species, we came up with 378 species in Maine that are at risk of declining to the point that they would require some sort of additional action needed if we don't do something now. When we looked at all of those different species and looked at all of the issues that are affecting them from habitat fragmentation, disease, um, what have you, and climate change, we found that a third of those species, a third of the 378, are affected negatively by climate change. So I want to give you some examples of some of these species that are in the action plan um, that are, for I think many of us, iconic species that are likely to be impacted by climate change. Here's one of my favorites. I am a, I'm a frog person, frog and salamander person. And so the mink frog is um, one of our... Uh, least studied frogs, I think here in Maine, it's one of the least known. They're very secretive. They have a very kind of um, secretive call that, that peaks at like three in the morning. And so many people haven't heard of them and they're associated with cold, deep water ponds. So they're at the very Southern edge of their range. They're one of these species that's highly vulnerable to climate change because of being at the Southern edge of the range and needing a habitat that stays cold. But here's another one. 
you may have heard of this species, and I'm sure you've seen this in the news recently. So moose, a very iconic species for our state. So Maine has the largest moose population of the lower 48 states. That being said, our moose population has experienced declines over the last 10 years or so. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the winter tick is a species that has persisted here for a very, very long time. It is not the same tick that causes Lyme disease or other types of illnesses. This is a, a, a species that is specific to things like deer and moose. They're not, you're not going to find them on yourself. So this species, what it does is it, winter tick, as its name suggests, is alive and feeding throughout the winter. And as an invertebrate, its, depend, its activity is dependent upon the external temperature and conditions around it. And so as you can imagine, warmer temperatures, less snow, shallower snowpack ends up killing less of these. And so what we've seen is that more and more outbreaks of really big populations of these winter ticks, especially in the winter time. And what happens is you can get many, many, many of these feeding on an individual moose. So this example I'm showing you here and research that was done here in Maine and in New Hampshire is up to 70,000 ticks on a single calf, on a single animal, feeding over the winter, feeding and feeding and feeding. Vampire ticks is the way to think about it. So that when spring comes, basically the moose calf is suffering from anemia, blood loss, and a bunch of other conditions, basically due to this, this tiny little epizootic. And what we've seen over the last few years is 70% of our, our calves, our moose calves, dying, in part because of the condition that is caused by this constant feeding of ticks over the winter. And we've seen out, and what's happening is while these, these ticks have, have are always sort of been around and persisted with moose, what we're seeing is outbreaks, more and more numbers of these ticks on our moose that are causing this really intense feeding and blood loss. And you can see in this, if you're hopefully not too squeamish, there's a, a pretty gross picture right here of, of showing basically the density of these winter tick larvae that are feeding on a calf over the winter. And they're just, they're just packed in like that. Other animals that are iconic are, are many of our bird species. Um, Cassie had mentioned in, in her portion about the loss of dry beaches and the expectation that if we do nothing, we could expect to lose about 97% of our dry beach area by 2100. Well, many of our, or some of our threatened and endangered species use those areas for nesting. Piping plovers are a are a fantastic example of that. They are already suffering from increased washouts of their nests because of stream events and erosion, increased recreation, things like that. Couple that with the loss of the habitat from increased seas, and they're getting basically narrowed out in terms of where they can actually breed on beaches. Another um, kind of coastal species to consider is the salt marsh sparrow. And this species breeds in the, in the high salt marsh area, kind of just above where the high tide will go. And so as, as tides are getting higher, storm events are often coupling with the high tide, their nests are getting, are getting flooded and basically the chicks are getting drowned out and can't get out of the nest to escape that rising tide. So you know, in this case, we have to think about some of the vulnerability characteristics of these species. They're tied to these really specialized habitats. They have limited mobility when they're nesting. And so they're really vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Eastern brook trout, another really iconic example, and I'm going to try to go quickly through some of these, require, you know, really cold water habitats. Here in Maine, we have the last, you know, 95% of the lake and pond habitat left for the species. And you can imagine with droughts and warmer stream temperatures, the habitat that these guys can, can persist in is limited. But it's not bad. Some species are expanding. Some species are moving in. Things like possums, which we didn't see here in Maine, you know, a decade or so ago, we're seeing more frequently now. Things like eastern bluebirds and red-bellied woodpeckers are expanding. And red-bellied woodpeckers, for example, are, have expanded all the way up the coast to Bar Harbor. So where we might be shifting some species north and losing those, others are coming in. So what can we do? So 
many of these recommendations we provided in the scientific and, and technical um, subcommittee assessment, as well as coming through the natural and working lands group and the coastal and marine working group. But I do want to talk about these a little bit here in the context of what we can all do, because I know sometimes it feels really overwhelming. You see photos of dead moose calves, you see photos of dead salt marsh sparrow chicks, and it's depressing. And you see a photo of like of this from my colleague, um, Kristen Pryor at the Maine Natural Areas Program of a huckleberry stand kind of on the edge of a salt marsh that's dying because that salt marsh is rising and flooding out that huckleberry. And, and so, you know, sometimes you look at this and this is how I feel when I feel about climate change. The forces are huge, right? But we're not helpless. There are things we can do and there are things that we can do now. One of the most important steps that we can take is to conserve and connect diverse landscapes. There's multiple reports out there, multiple studies that show this. If we're conserving a diversity of landscapes, lakes, mountaintops, riparian areas, hardwood forests, mixed forests, softwood forests, if we're conserving that diversity and connecting those areas, things can move on the landscape as they will by allowing working forests to continue, by allowing conservation to continue, by doing it in a strategic way that links up areas, we can create basically the matrix in which these things, these animals, these plants can move about on the landscape. There's some examples here that I've shown of, of, of habitats that are connected, including this one here where the Maine DOT installed a wildlife crossing structure up in Northern Maine. We actually have Canada lynx moving through it. A lot of the science, I won't go into too, too much detail in the interest of time, but I do want to give you sort of the scientific basis of this. The basis is this concept of the, the resilient and connected landscape, conserving the stage. Much of this comes from Mark Anderson's work out of the Nature Conservancy. And basically what, it, what this work says is that a lot of the diversity we see on the landscape is tied to the underlying geodiversity. So what is the underlying geology, the landforms, aspect, all that kind of stuff. The diversity of that is directly tied with biodiversity. So if we can conserve the diversity of habitats on this earth, the diversity of underlying geology and landforms, everything that's on top of that stage, the players, the fish, the turtles, the plants, that stuff can move around at will as long as we're conserving the underlying stage that supports those species. And so there's this, this theory of, you know, this resilient and connected landscape conserves a variety of geodiverse landforms, connects them up, and allows things to move as they will. That addresses a lot of things. It doesn't address everything. For species that can't move, for species that can't shift, obviously we need to focus a little bit differently. This is sort of a, a global initiative that many, many different organizations are focusing on, including here in Maine and the um, Eastern Canadian provinces have a resolution to look at connectivity, habitat connectivity, as an adaptation strategy for conserving biodiversity, but other initiatives as well, the Yellowstone to Yukon initiative, the Staying Connected initiative, all use this as sort of an underlying tenet to approach conservation. And so you might ask, well, is it Maine connected? We're pretty good. Um, we're 90% forested. We're the most forested state in the U.S. But if you look at the pattern of development, so this is a map from the Maine Mountain Collaborative overlaying the road network on top of forested areas, we end up looking pretty fragmented because that imprint, that, that footprint of the road extends way beyond the road. The footprint of a house extends way beyond the house because of all sorts of different factors, runoff, dogs barking, what have you. And so if you look at it with that lens, our landscape is somewhat fragmented and we continue to lose about 10,000 acres annually. Um, the Eastern Research Group that um, Cassandra talked about in her presentation estimated that we are losing about 10,000 acres of natural working forest land every year. That's expected to increase to about 15,000 acres annually in 2030 and continue to climb. So what do we do? How do we do this? We can take steps now. Take the stream, for example. Um, an effort was made to allow stream water to flow through there, but it, it probably doesn't pass a lot of fish. So replacing structures like that with structures that allow for stream flow, allow for organisms to move through, not just things in the water, but things that are using the riparian areas along the stream bank, 
benefit many, many things, turtles, fish, aquatic organisms, even sometimes more common species that we see on the landscape and maybe don't think about um, having any uh, impediments to movement, but even things like black bear will use structures, these big, big structures underneath roads to move about on the landscape. Doing things like planting um, uh, wildflowers and pollinator diverse plants along roadsides and in backyards helps create that connectivity among different patches of landscape that can allow different species to move. And also putting in things like large structures has multiple co-benefits, not just to the species moving under them or near them, but also in terms of flooding. If you can put in a structure that allows the stream to move as a stream, you're likely also going to prevent things like what happened here in the Carabasset Valley um, when basically the sugar loaf was cut off because of major flooding associated with Tropical Storm Irene. And so I want to just kind of jump ahead a little bit and, and finish up here so we have time for questions. But, you know, we can talk about sort of large scale statewide planning and we can look at things like where resilient landscapes are occurring. This map here on the left shows that those places of bright green are where, where it's modeled to be the most resilient geodiverse places on our landscape. And we can approach statewide planning in terms of making sure we're conserving those, the diversity of those and connecting those. And that's really important. And that's part of what this Maine Climate Council process will help us do. But it also does come down to what we want to do in our own backyards and as community. How do we want to manage and conserve our lands locally? So the Bethel Community Forest is an example of, of a, a collaborative approach that connects habitat patches between Bethel and Sunday River, provides recreational opportunities, protects drinking water, and supports working forest. And so we need to think at different scales. How do we approach this at a large statewide planning scale? How do we approach it within our communities and how do we approach it in our own backyards? And just to offer this up, I coordinate this beginning with Habitat program at IFNW and we offer assistance to communities, landowners, land trusts that are considering these questions of where are the habitat patches in my area? How can I connect them? What uses them? What are the best practices? So please feel free to reach out with any questions or if you need support on any of that, that's what we're here for. And we're celebrating our 20th birthday. So I wanted to put that on the screen. We are the longest running collaborative conservation program of its kind in the Northeast. So um, please reach out with any questions. And so I wanna leave you with this. Conserving lands obviously helps a variety of things. It helps wildlife. It helps us have opportunities to recreate, but it also sequesters a ton of carbon. 75% of Maine's carbon emissions are sequestered in our forests. We we get a lot of economic revenue from our natural and working lands, 620 million from the forest products industry, 8.2 billion in outdoor recreation that's tied to these areas. And most of us recreate, about 70% of us recreate. So there are multiple, multiple co-benefits. But I also wanna put this in the context of sort of the global responsibility that we have. Cassie mentioned how our climate goals fit into global climate goals as well. Our forests, our natural and working lands are the lungs of this region. We often think about the rainforest being so important and they are, but right in our backyards, I think we forget this. We have the Northern Appalachian Acadian region. We have the most intact temperate broadleaf forest in the world right here. And Maine within the circle bears a big brunt of that in terms of land that is still forested and still intact. I won't go into this, but please reference the report for additional recommendations we provide to um, protect biodiversity and to, to adapt for changing conditions. Um, but sort of my final take home is that, you know, as a conservation scientist, obviously I'm interested in doing whatever we can to conserve biodiversity and the systems that, that need, to, need to underlie things for biodiversity to persist. But, you know, honestly, it really comes down to what I have here on the slide here. It comes down to my kids. Um, and it comes down to thinking about the legacy I'm leaving behind for them. And so if there's one take home I can leave you with today, it's that, you know, don't be like the dying huckleberries along the salt marsh. 
there are things that we can do. There are things that we can do today, whether it be planting a pollinator garden in your backyard that helps connect habitat patches around you or managing your woodlot for birds and mine. Audubon has a great program to help you do that. Serving on your town comprehensive planning board and making those sort of land use decisions at a town scale, all of that collectively does make a difference. And so be in touch. We're here to support you. And with that, I'm going to um, turn off my presentation and be here for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda, very much. Um, we are pushing on time. So we have a, a few more things we want to get to before we get to questions. Um, I um, want to say very quickly, uh, Eliza Donahue, my colleague, cannot join us today, but she wanted to send her regards. She wanted to send uh, a note about how important the Climate Council process has been for her and for Maine Audubon. Um, Eliza was on the Natural Working Lands Working Group. Uh, my colleague Sally Stockwell was also on the Science and Technical Subcommittee as well. Um, Maine Audubon is excited about this plan due December 1st, and we're excited about uh, the next steps. Um, in the plan itself, we are there's a lot of recommendations um, that are uh, up for deliberation for in there. We are focusing on a small subset. Um, there are lots more important ones out there, but we're focusing on the ones most aligned with our mission, which is you know wild protective wildlife and habitat. Uh, you know, very, very briefly, that means um, working, obviously we know we need additional renewable energy site uh, in the state. Uh, we're strong supporters of uh, renewable energy. We also know that it needs to be sited properly so that uh, we're not uh, losing habitat, we're not losing connectivity as those things, they, those things are installed. And so Maine Audubon has a number of resources about um, solar siting on our website that you could check out. Um, we also, uh, know that um, local town planning, as Amanda um, uh, discussed, is really important. So we are very supportive of um, specific actions from included in the Climate Action Plan that, that bring more land planning support to towns, um, and uh, as well as change basic land use regulations to keep development out of areas, out of vulnerable areas for wildlife. Um, and then, you know, and then there are some next steps. So the plan is just a plan, right? Then we have to, to take it um, and actually put it into action. And that means legislation, it means regulation. Um, so we need to be there throughout that to make sure that the recommendations are put in place and are, and are followed through and acted upon. So stay tuned to Maine Audubon for that. I see a question in the, uh, the Q&A about the next steps. Um, and so I wanna turn it over to uh, Cassandra Rose to talk about uh, what's going on at the Climate Council. And I should say too, we're gonna get to questions right after she's finished. So if you have additional questions for afterwards, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them as soon as we're done. So Cassandra, if you could take it away. Thanks, Nick. I'll be very quick so we can get to questions. I placed the dates of the next two Climate Council meetings in the chat and like I said before, they're welcome. Uh, they're all open to public observation. You're welcome to join us. So as Nick said exactly, um, the Climate Council is, uh, is working towards the December 1st plan. And it's really in the process of looking at all of the, not only strategies, but the actions that have been recommended to achieve those strategies right now. And so they're really digging into the details and having some great discussions in the context of all the information and modeling um, that I mentioned before to really uh, select the, uh, the recommended actions to achieve those strategies, as well as those actions that might take a little bit longer or more steady or stakeholder processes to achieve. Um, so you can see the details and recordings from recent meetings um, on our website um, and to, to get a fuller understanding of where they're at. But, um, Moving forward, I, I'm going to jump straight into a, a good question um, that asked, you know, what happens once the action plan is delivered on December 1st? Well, really, this is a plan for the legislature and the governor and state agencies to implement. Um, so the climate action plan will um, uh, uh, require some legislation and and rulemaking, um, but in many cases, the, the state agencies right now are reviewing to see where some of these recommended actions can actually fit into existing programs um, or where existing programs might be strengthened to achieve these actions. Um, so there's a great deal of review going on at the state agency level to help 
um, provide some context to the Climate Council as well as to what existing programs there are to achieve the recommendations and um, where there are still some, some gaps. Um, so that's all I wanted to add on. I'm going to turn it to Nick, back over to Nick to moderate the Q&A. Great. Um, thank you so much. We have a few minutes left before noon. Uh, unless people really need to jump on, I'm happy to stay until all our questions are answered. Um, Amanda, there you go. Um, so thank you. Again, if you have questions, please type them into the uh, Q&A box down there and we'll get going. Um, so the first question was from Tom. Um, and I think it's for probably Cassandra or well, anyone who wants to speak, uh, to speak about the bipartisan nature of the council's work. Um, you know, it, was it a bipartisan group? Um, was there, uh, you know, what was the nature of the debate and discussion? Yes, it's actually quite a bipartisan effort. So the legislation passed out of committee um, unanimously and passed with really broad bipartisan support in the the state legislature. And the way the Climate Council was set up was that the Climate Council and each of the working groups and the scientific and technical subcommittee would have bipartisan legislative involvement. So each of these groups had both um, uh, representatives from the two major parties, as well as a representative from the state house, as well as the state senate. So we had bipartisan, bicameral cameral involvement um, in all of the groups. And generally, the public feedback that we've received has been overwhelmingly positive and very supportive. I think there's a very broad understanding that the time for action is now. We don't have a lot of time to waste to start reducing our emissions and planning for the impacts of climate change. Um, the science is very, very overwhelming. And I think here in Maine, there, there's such value placed on and, and pride based on preserving and protecting our communities and our environments. That's a really big value to everybody we've heard from. And folks are really willing and energetic about getting together to talk about solutions that work for our communities. So we've generally seen really positive interactions and support. And I think moving forward into the implementation, um, continuing to see that positive support for action, particularly in this really challenging time of reduced resources, um, will help ensure that we can start down the path of, um, of achieving some of the goals in the Climate Action Plan. Yeah, and just to add briefly, you know, the, the impacts of climate change are not pot not partisan, right? They affect everyone uh, equally, and so you know, this is an initiative to protect all Mainers, regardless of, you know, party or or affiliation. And and I think even more than that, you know, this is an opportunity um, uh, for economic uh, uh, innovation. You know, uh, we can get in front of these problems and figure out ways to to um, to innovate and to you know, create solutions that'll bring us into the future. This is going to be a positive thing for Maine. Um, uh, so uh, hopefully it's something we all have to get behind. There's always, you know, uh, difficulty getting things passed or reaching agreement, of course. That's the normal part of the democratic process. Um, but uh, we think we're, um, there'll be support from across the aisle. And we know there's an, an input from, from lots of different uh, angles in Maine. Uh, so thanks, Tom. Um, question from Edward about recycling. Um, what's the role of recycling in either the climate action plan or in uh, climate change? Any thoughts there? Yes, so I will say that we actually had a, one of the past climate action plans in um, that Maine undertook. I want to say it's the 2004 plan um, that had a number of recommendations to reduce emissions. Um, did address uh, waste management um, quite a bit, and they they had some modeling there. Um, in this climate action planning process, we didn't have a great deal of, of modeling around the emission savings of recycling. Um, and I know that, that some of the feedback that we received from the public to really um, include waste management, include recycling. Um, and so I, I can't say I have a great deal of knowledge of what the, the exact um, emission savings are from, from recycling. But I think generally Maine is has had a long um, history of, of 
you know, trying to tackle waste reduction and recycling. Um, and I think one area where, where the state can help lead in this is in our um, lead by example um, initiatives that are starting to get off the ground where, um, and this, this sort of a recommendation in the plan as well, that the state can help provide um, helpful examples where we can reduce not only, our, we can be more efficient with our energy usage, but also um, our waste. And so I think as we move forward, we'll start to see more examples of that in pilot projects. Um, it wasn't a large part of this plan. I completely, you know, under completely agree with the the commenter, but um, but I think moving forward, it will be interesting to see how um, how we can model some of the the emission savings from from that sector. Great, thanks. Um, a question here from anonymous about transportation. She says, "Is my." Uh, Anonymous says, it's my understanding that transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Maine, correct? I can say that is correct. Um, what are some low-hanging fruits to mitigate climate change by reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions trans from the transportation sector? Um, and can you say what the Climate Council is sort of considering for recommendations? Absolutely. And the commenter is absolutely right. Transportation is 54% of our emissions in Maine. We're a little unusual among U.S. states. We're very a very large rural state and so folks do drive quite a bit and this is one sector where our emissions have been going up over the last several years. So trans some of the low hanging fruit that the transportation working group identified are really trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled, trying to support people in, um, in uh, uh, both, I think, as we're seeing with the current pandemic, um, seeing where they can reduce the number of trips they take to go to work or to run their errands, doing things like that. Um, they really, they made a recommendation along with the Economic Recovery Committee and um, the state economic plan to really expand broadband in our state, which can help support working from home for more Mainers. Um, but the, the greenhouse gas emissions modeling that Eastern Research Group helped um, guide really identified a couple of big um, uh, strategies to reduce our emissions. Um, and uh, in addition to reducing vehicle miles traveled, another is um, switching to, to electrifying our transportation. Now, what that includes both having more electric cars on our roads, as well as switching to things like electric bikes and um, supporting people to um, walk or bike more in their communities. Um, so I would actually refer the, the commenter to the modeling because it has a lot of great details on uh, what the biggest bang for the buck is. Um, and the transportation working group report also has some great details on the low hanging fruit that we can do very quickly um, with current programs. And I should plug as well, the climate spotlight presentation we gave uh, in August, I guess, about transportation. Um, I, put, I just put a link in the chat that featured uh, Emily Green from Conservation Law Foundation and Barry Woods from Revision Energy, who knows all about electric cars and various transportation solutions. So give that a give that a check out there. Um, so a couple of questions left, and then we'll we'll get out of dodge here. We're a few minutes over. Thanks for sticking sticking to us. Um, Jake asks, um, can the Tree City USA project be uh, combined with climate work? or uh, how does that maybe relate to that work? It's not actually a program I'm familiar with, but. I'm not either. Is it I, um, Amanda? Yeah, I have, I have very minor familiarity with it, but I did just look up. Um, so the Arbor Day Foundation does have a bulletin available for how the Tree City USA project relates to climate change. So I can post that as I guess an answer to this question here in the question and answer box. But I would say, you know, I don't know structurally what, what that would look like, but I would say absolutely focusing on, I know Orland's not necessarily a, an urban or, or a suburban area, but certainly focusing on any trees that we can help conserve and plant 
you know, do help sequester carbon, do help store carbon. And certainly from a human health perspective, if you're talking about reducing, you know, air temperatures in areas that have a lot of pavement and things like that, recreational benefits, mental health benefits of having more natural and open spaces, um, it all ties in. But I would say, you know, formally as far as, as part of the Tree City USA project, I'll put that bulletin in that in that chat box so you have a link to it and can start and can start there. Right. And again, the benefit of doing all these climate spotlight presentations is that, is that we have presentations on a lot of different topics. So I just also posted the um, the presentation that we gave about uh, forests as natural climate solutions. So if you're interested in figuring, seeing how um, some really great information from uh, uh, Adam uh, Diagono uh, from the University of Maine about how uh, forests actually sequester carbon, what it actually means to take it out of the air and put it in the ground. It's really great stuff. Um, so uh, finally here, uh, a question about, you know, how much of a priority do we think that the conservation and connectivity stuff is going to be in the final plan? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, the focus, you know, is on greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Um, I, I can speak a, a little bit to that too, but I'd um, uh, 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 love uh, Cassandra to hear from you and Amanda. Yeah. I'll, I'll actually say that really this is, it's a plan that definitely um, it recognizes that reducing our emissions is sort of the first step to also adapting to climate change and that it's going to reduce our impacts. But this is the first climate action plan that Maine is undertaking that both addresses reducing our emissions as well as adapting to the impacts of climate change and becoming more resilient to those impacts. Those are on equal footing. Really, we can't um, just do one and not and not address the other because climate change is already impacting our state. And I will say that um, habitat connectivity and preserving our species is also elevated as one of the um, the guiding principles um, to the entire planning process. Um, the plan very clear, the legislation really clearly lays out that we can't just preserve our communities, we also need, and industries, but we also need to consider our environment and our habitats and our wildlife species. And it charged the STS with coming up with um, methods for doing that. But the working groups like Natural and Working Lands and Coastal Marine also address these really important goals as well. Um, I think further, uh, or one thing in addition to that is that the Natural and Working Lands Group and Coastal Marine um, Working Group recognize that having healthy environments and habitats also, also helps us to reduce, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So. CO2 going into natural environments and getting pulled out of the atmosphere and buried in soils um, for a long period of time. And so um, what we what the strategies have tried to do is not just achieve, you know, emissions reductions and sequestering, but also try to um, identify strategies where we can achieve a lot of these important co-benefits as well, like having more habitat connectivity and preserving our species. Um, so we, we're trying to do a lot at the same time. Uh, I will say that we've had a lot of fantastic involvement from scientists like Dr. Cross, who have helped the Climate Council to understand that this is a really important um, part of achieving these goals. Um, and you can, all, you can have habitat connectivity and preservation of species as well as reducing emissions. Um, and sequestering carbon at the same time. So we're trying yeah. to, as much as possible, not lose sight of these really important um, aspects of the plan as well. And I think it's actually a great point to end on because um, you know the working groups and the council have done an incredible job of um, doing some really great thinking in, in wildlife conservation and connectivity and providing some really great recommendations. Uh, but I think moving forward, and we are, you know, thinking about moving forward already. Um, all these priorities uh, are, are up to us, right? Up to the uh, up to Maine Audubon members, and up to the state of Maine, who's going to elect re uh, representatives to pass these things and to put them into place. And so, um, you know, for all the folks watching this now, we we're going to continue to need your help to make this a priority and make all, make climate reduction uh, and climate solutions a priority moving forward. So. Um, so uh, the, the plan, we are very much looking forward to the re release of the plan in December, and we're looking forward to you know, continuing on after that because a lot of work needs to happen. 
Um, so thank you so much, Sandra Rose, Amanda Cross for joining me today. This was fantastic. Um, thanks to everyone who joined and stuck with a little bit over time. Uh, thanks to anyone who joined any of the climate uh, spotlight presentations that we've done. This has been a really fun series and we're so glad to end it with a bang today. Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having us. Thank you for the invitation. Great to see you all. Great. Take care. Bye.